what type say he thinks about type level. <laughs> and uh, you know, he wanted he wanted to start playing more. But uh, I, I just want to clarify one thing from our perspective. You know, we see our compiler as being sort of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux of compilers, and we see the type level one as being a much more Fedora-like kind of implementation. We think that there's no reason that they can't coexist and be productive together. So, you know, this is an exciting thing. I think it would be uh, bad if people like Miles and, and uh, you know, John and all the people in the type level community weren't a part of the community helping drive forward innovation with the language. So, you know, I'm glad to see that they found a way to be a part of the community and still contribute. Right. That's it. Yeah. From a personal perspective, <laughs> I'm worried a little bit about some of the interactions of the type level group. So, that's me. It's not type safe saying this. You know, I am concerned about the way people treat each other. And I, I worry that certain people in that group do not have a level of politeness to be able to interact in a positive way with everyone. And um, I'm concerned. I'm on the record saying that now. Yeah. Anyway, uh, is it time? Huh? Rats. Okay, so hi, I'm Jamie Allen, as you probably all know by now. Uh, I'm here to talk about testing reactive applications. And the reason I'm talking about this is because, you know, first of all, yes, I'm the author of Rebecca Baca, it's a very cute little pamphlet. But I'm also a co-author with Roland Kuhn on reactive design patterns. And one of the things we identified very early while we were writing this book is that there wasn't a lot of knowledge about how to test whether or not an application was reactive. Um, there are a lot of nuances to it. And so, you know, it's an early chapter inside of the book, right now chapter four, which we are just about finished up with at this point. Um, you know, we're, we're focused on making sure that people understand the dynamics of testing for reactive. So, who needs tests? How many people write tests? Yeah, it should be all of us, right? Except John Freddy over there, who's writing a platform as a service without tests. I'm sure everybody is going to jump through Rapture now. <laughs> Rapture -ra -ra has long since ceased to be a platform as a service. Oh, okay. So That's a library, true. Jason Library. Yeah. Uh, adjacent library, very large. The, the, the platform as a service didn't work. Okay. Yeah. I like to make that joke. Um, but, I mean, your business really depends on this, right? If you're going to create software and your enterprise is investing in this and they're paying us money to build it for them, there's no reason that this application shouldn't be tested deeply. It's got to prove itself across a bunch of different vectors. And we don't do this. Nobody does. I go to very few places and find people who are doing deep testing of all of the ways applications need to scale and be elastic and resilient, right? Because if we're not doing both of these things, then there's no way we can be responsive to our users. So with tests, we know and we can be confident that what we're putting out there is going to work. I don't like walking around feeling like my software is going to break just because, you know, I've deployed a new version and I've got that white knuckle feeling that I've put something out there that may not work. But if we follow certain rules, we can build software that is going to work and we can have confidence in no matter when it goes out, how it's deployed, and no matter what the world throws at it. Because the reality is we don't know what's going to go wrong. And that's what Reactive is largely about. So what does reactive testing mean? First of all, we've all seen the reactive manifesto, right? Who has not seen the reactive manifesto? All right, good. Wow, that's awesome, actually. Now, a lot of people think that the reactive, not a lot. I've heard a few people say that the reactive manifesto is just pure architecture. And I would agree, whenever I first heard it myself, that I was a little, you know, uh, this seems kind of hand wavy and unimportant. But the more I thought about it, the more it really started to grow on me. More importantly, I realized that we're not building systems that meet these rules, right? Message-driven, purely asynchronous, non-blocking. In some cases, we can't even build software that is fully non-blocking at this time with things like database drivers, right? Uh, being elastic, 
being fault tolerant, and then also at the end of the day being responsive to our users. So, you know, the way we're building software for all those people who say, well, yeah, you know, everybody knows that. How come we're not building software this way, right? And then what we need to do is prove it. So what do we need? Look at all of the kinds of tests there are out there. I mean, I probably have even forgotten some. You can, you can go into a major consulting firm from, you know, the big four, big five, or whatever they're called now, and they have huge stacks of books that explain everything you're supposed to do in testing. And the reason is risk, because they're scared of getting sued. And if they do get sued, the partner wants to look down at the project manager, is going to look down at the team leader, is going to look down at the developer and say, you know what, I can prove that you did not write a test here, you're fired. Dead serious. And I started out in this world in 1993 with Pricewaterhouse that was doing consulting. And, you know, we didn't have any of these testing frameworks. We had to do it all by hand, literally in spreadsheets, signing off that we ran this test. And it took just as much time to write out all the test plans as it did to actually execute the test. So those are the good old days, right? And by the way, I promised uh, Budo that I would have some form of my little pony in here, so apologies for the picture. <clears throat> so what we need to do is let our tests guide our design. Right? As we're building out our tests, it should be influencing the design of our application as well. We need to think from the reverse onion philosophy, starting from the inside and working outward, instead of the idea of peeling an onion, which you do from the outside in, think instead from the core and working out. We have to test every unit in our software. We're already probably doing this. This is the basic idea of unit tests that we all are probably already following, hopefully. You know, just write a test that proves that this you know, interface works, this, this part of the class works. But then we also have to check the APIs. We have to check the service. Beyond that, we have to check the application itself. And we have to check the infrastructure that we're deploying on. Which means that we're no longer talking about merely just testing the application. We're testing what it's deployed on and its ability to leverage that infrastructure, right? Before, how many people are doing this? Right. Is anybody running tests right now that actually tests your infrastructure that you're deploying to? One. Two. Two. Yeah, that's about it. It's kind of scary, huh? I mean, your application only runs well if it's on hardware that's working. And when failures occur, and they do, what is, what's going to happen to your application? How is it going to respond to that? So, first of all, there's a, a certain vocabulary that's being established around the Reactive Manifesto. If you go to you know, reactivemanifesto.org and you go to the glossary link, you'll see a whole bunch of definitions to make sure everybody's describing things in the exact same way. There is a difference between errors and failures. Errors are what happen inside of your application. If you have a validation that goes, you know, and says that this is not good data, that's an error. If you have an exception that occurs because of a null pointer exception or something, that's also an error. But a failure is whenever something goes wrong external to your application. It's whenever the network has a partition, or whenever you have a disk failure, or you know a data center goes down. That's a failure, obviously. So make sure that when you're describing these, you're being very clear in your terms. Errors versus failures. And when we're testing, we want to think about white box versus black box testing. Black box testing is very much like what we're used to with the idea of functions. You have inputs and outputs. You give it a certain kind of data, and you get outputs out. And it very well lends itself to tools like Scala Check and Quick Check and Haskell, where you do property-based testing. How many people use those tools? Yeah. Everybody should. They help you tremendously because they test it in ways that you're not going to be able to think about. There's no way you're going to think of every possible combination of inputs that can go in there, and these will help you do that. Over time, they will probably find something that does break your, your uh, code. White boxing is slightly different. White box is whenever you send something in, and then you have to check the internal state or something to find out whether that effect had a result somewhere. So it, it didn't return something necessarily, it might, 
but you're actually checking something inside of your class or inside of your actor, and no response necessary. This is uh, also more likely to be invalidated when you refactor code, because it's dependent on what's inside of the class, whereas with the black box testing, you're just passing something in and you're getting something out. So black box testing sounds much more functional in nature. It's probably where we want to go most of the time, but at the same time, we also don't want to expose things from our class simply for the, the point of testing. So our test environment. For testing a reactive application, the test environment must be exactly the same as production. How many people have seen the tech and power benchmarks? Yeah, I know you, Matt. Matthias is sitting out here, he's the guy who created Spray. Yes, of course he has seen the tech and power benchmarks, because let's face it, they exploded on the scene with this idea of showing people how many requests per second every one of these different RESTful frameworks could handle. You know, web frameworks like Play were compared against Netty. Which is funny because at the time play was actually just you know over net. Um, so it's good that people have this rough idea of the performance of these various frameworks. But at the same time, uh, running them on a laptop, which they admitted to doing, is probably not the right kind of infrastructure to validate performance, right? So we have this problem whenever we're writing our code. We're writing our code and, and we, uh, you know, we, we come up with a new class, we write a test, and then we execute it on our laptop or on our you know, work machine, whatever that is. It's not the same as the machines that we're going to deploy to. And that means you're going to have variance in how it performs. That's not necessarily what you want. There are ways to fix it. We'll talk about that shortly. But these laptops don't have anywhere near as much RAM, anywhere near as many cores. Their disks aren't probably as fast. Their caches are much smaller on the pipelines down to the floor. And then there's the cloud. The cloud adds a whole other dimension of uncertainty. It's just, you know, insane. How many people believe a hypervisor whenever it tells you how many cores you have? <laughs> this is a very wise group. Honestly, it's hilarious. Then it, it, it's going to give you a number because you ask. Doug Lee says this. You know, you ask for a number, you're going to get one, but it's a lie. Because it's his job. It's got to tell you something. And this actually makes it really hard to, this makes it hard to figure out the threading model for applications that are going to be multi-thread, right? You need to figure out the sizing of, you know, how many of your thread pools. And you're going to run on infrastructure where you have no idea how many cores you're actually going to have. Good luck. So I, 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 I have trouble with sizing thread pools for cloud. And if I have a general idea that I'm using an M1 large or some medium or something like that, then I can at least have a rough idea. But if I'm trying to be very specific and I want to use tools that are going to pin the cores, like Disruptor, that affects the dynamics of my program in very fundamental ways. Test on the hardware you're going to use in production. So in 2010, Martin Fowler came out with this blog post about blue-green deployment. How many people saw this? It was a really great idea because it said, you know, you're going to have multiple slices of your application. And what this means is I've got my blue in production, and whenever I want to roll out a whole new version, and mind you, this is from a very monolithic standpoint, right? I want to go from blue to green. I want to turn the switch and put green into production, and now blue will be sitting in background not doing anything. Well, that's kind of good because what if the cutover doesn't go well? What if there's a real fundamental problem inside of the software? You can always switch it back and go back to your previous version, no harm done. But you can also use the unused slice as your testing region. You can do all your testing on it. And if you break this down to the microservice level, Every one of the microservices can have their own blue and green slices, right? What's hard for me with blue green is knowing the time when I can say, all right, now I want to let go of the previous version because I know that the one that's deployed now is fine. And this is the point in time when I'm going to start doing my testing on that slice. That's hard because the critical failures don't automatically show up immediately. They tend to show up at very random times. 
So whenever you do make that decision, suddenly you're not going to have that fallback position ready to go at a moment's notice. So choose wisely or go with a third slice. For companies with a lot of money, that's an option. For the companies that don't have a lot of money, then it probably isn't. So the primary difficulties that we have here when we're dealing with testing reactive systems is that we have asynchronous components, right? We've got a lot of asynchrony inside of the application, and that means things become less deterministic, right? Um, so things will happen in orders that we didn't expect. Um, there's no way at the JVM level, for sure, to know when something is going to be scheduled to an actual core of execution. So leads to odd things. I mean, we can have partitions that occur within a box and outside of boxes, but we also start dealing with things like race conditions, right? When things happen out of the order we expect, uh, deadlocks, you know, whenever we've got two things vying for the same resource, you know, one's locked on A and the other's locked on B, while the first one is trying to get B and the second one's trying to get A, it's tough. The worst one is actually a live lock. How many people have had a live lock? How many people know what a live lock is? Yeah, it's tricky. If you've ever walked down the street and somebody's coming at you in the opposite direction, you both go to the left and you both go to the right, you're not getting around each other. I mean, eventually you do, but that's a live lock, but it's in software. Deadlocks, we at least have things like JSTAG that tell us when we've got one. And all of our monitoring tools can show us when we have deadlock. But live locks, much more insidious. You've got to identify when there's two parts of your application that can't get around each other, but they're still working just fine. They're very reactive. Ah. So I, I, I actually liken live locks a lot to SVM. Has anybody ever used software transactional memory? Okay, a couple people. It's great whenever you have very low amounts of data coming in, but software transactional memory success depends on three different dimensions. The amount of data you want to change, how often it changes, and the locality of that data on cache lines, believe it or not. Physical cache lines inside of uh, you know, memory can affect how SVM works. And so it, it itself becomes non-deterministic based upon the kind of machine that's running on. Well, that's not true. It becomes fairly deterministic. But you have to have the exact same conditions. I think that's a fair way of putting it. Either way, at some point, it will fall over. And it's difficult to say exactly when that will be. So when it does, all that happens is things trying to commit and not committing, trying to commit and not committing. It's rough. So testing asynchronously. <coughs> We want to make sure that we add non-deterministic uh, testing tools to our, 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 our pocket, if you will, right? We have futures out there. We have actors. We have all these different kinds of components that we use to write asynchronous code. And we need to be able to test them effectively. With testing asynchronously, we have to be time focused. We can't be unbounded in time. I mean, most of the things that you're using right now do provide to you a timeout mechanism, thankfully. If we didn't have that, there'd be no way to really check whether or not something met our rules for how quickly it has to respond. And we also have to think about what to do when nothing happens. That may be perfectly legitimate, and it may not be. You have to have tests to deal with this. Um, the assertions that we have have to be completely different, right? Ordinarily, we would do assertions based on matchers through tools like Amprest, right? Now our assertions are going to be about what we expect to happen from messages that are being passed around. Assuming you're going with a reactive application where messages are, you know, the core communication aspect. And then you must test your service and your level agreements that you're putting up there, what you're telling people you're going to provide them. And testing SLAs is broadly about responsiveness. Right? And you must contest your concurrent interactions. I talk about this in Effective ACA. You can't just send a message and see if you get a value back. Right? You get a message back that says that this is the response. You have to send a bunch of messages. And you have to make sure that the appropriate caller gets the response they expected. Not going to different you know, clients than the one you expected. Our testing frameworks have to change as a result. We have to do more that's externally configurable. We have to make time externally configurable. 
Some of this is already reflected, actually most of it is really already reflected inside of Agus test kit. And then if you look at Scala test, it has it as well. Um, but what this deals with is when we run on our laptop, we're going to see different timings and we're going to see running on a really fast production server. And if we're going to execute our tests in a production-like environment, we need to be able to say that the timing should be more strict than they would be if they ran on our laptop or on a CI server, which is probably overloaded by all the things it's doing anyway. So make sure that these tools that you're using allow you to configure time externally so that you can scale time depending on the kind of box you're running on. We must support the execution of multiple concurrent requests. We must support individual receivers that you know, allow these concurrent requests to provide the data back to the appropriate checker that you have the right data. Time must be bounded, responses are not guaranteed, and time itself, external configuration. Service level agreements, again, must be performed concurrently. You can't do SLA testing just by going out and sending a single request. Um, and by saying here that you can perform them all at once, you can lump a group together, send out a whole bunch of requests at the same time. If that's what you're trying to check, does my SLA get met by all of these requests going out instead of just one? Um, and the important thing is you need a context. You need a way of saying that for this request, I'm able to check that the latency in response was exactly what I expected for this particular one. Plus, you can group them and say, well, okay, let's get rid of you know, the, the top whatever percentage, like 0.5% or 0.1%, just you know, sort and lead out that, those numbers so that you have the ability to say, all right, it's a 99%, 99.9%, 99.99%. So execution schedules vary, as I said earlier. We know that whenever we're running, we're going to have applications that are you know, uh, scheduled to a core at different um, intervals, depending on the actual run. Um, and this makes it absolutely valid that our tests are non-deterministic. Uh, but we have to find ways to write our tests that actually focus on that, you know, allow us to prove that our application is running correctly. Results can be completely random in this order. You don't know that you're going to get a list of exactly the same elements in this specific order. So testing that means saying, how many elements do I have to contain every one of these? Uh, distribution must be validated. The distribution of uh, our application across the varying platforms it's running on. And asserting that no messages returned is really tricky. It's hard to do without the right tools in place. So for elasticity, this is not the same thing as load testing. It's a little bit broader. Now we're actually going to say that our application can scale up across all the machines we need, as opposed to dealing with an application that you know is just going to run on five boxes. We need to be able to say that we have access to 10. Are we going to scale up to all 10 whenever we have the right amount of load? And are we going to scale back down whenever we don't have that much load, so we're not wasting resources? <coughs> You have to have platforms that allow you to query them to find out exactly what you know, nodes are currently up. And there are several tools out there that support this sort of thing. First of all, Zookeeper. How many people are using Zookeeper? Probably a fair number, yeah. Um, because it's sort of, I, I, I tweeted this once, it's the duct tape of distributed systems. And this is by no stretch of the imagination a rip on Zookeeper. It is an amazing tool. It's just that you know, it does a lot of stuff and people use it in a lot of different ways. There's Kubernetes, which is the one with the, uh, the wheel up there, and Mesos for resource negotiation, much like Yarn and Hadoop. This is how we scale varying boxes. It tries to treat the entire data center as if those boxes are one and scale all the work across varying nodes and manage the nodes up and down. And then Docker. Docker has an API, as does Mesos, that allows you to do checks on what's happening inside these boxes. You can leverage these APIs to figure out whether or not your application is up and running, or down, or if an image is up or not. For resilience, first of all, let's think about errors. What happens inside of our application, right? These are very typical. This is the kind of testing you've probably been doing a fair amount of already, because 
you have tests that say that I expect some sort of exception to come back. Well, we also have external resilience that says whether uh, invalid data coming in is you know, being checked appropriately. Internal exceptions are being thrown and resulting in appropriate behavior. But the API of our, API of our classes should never be changing to allow for this test to be you know, performed. We have to place some sort of mechanism in between which will allow us to communicate with our class as we want. So here's a really simple example. This is actually one of Roland's patterns. It's called failure pattern, or failure error. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking an actor rep as my instructor argument. I'm saying that I'm going to take an actor whenever I start this class, whenever I create it. And I'm going to create a child whenever I uh, instantiate myself in the constructor of the actor. And then my supervisor strategy, I now know who to tell that I got failures. This is a way of putting an intermediary between my tests and my code under tests so that I don't have to figure out what happened externally in that white box way. Now, with this, I can just say, all right, well, the exception that I expected was thrown, and it's reported back to me inside of my test. So I, I've had a bit of a, a problem whenever I'm out in the field working with customers, and that's that a lot of people are big fans of domain-driven design. How many people here use domain-driven design? Wow, that's it. Okay. All right, well, uh, so domain-driven design is a really great way to, you know, organize your application and model it so that you know that you're, you know, assembling boundaries appropriately and you your data organized in a meaningful way. Um, but one of the things that's also inside of DDD is the concept of domain events. So with domain events, you're defining how your application is going to communicate inside of itself. And these are a really big deal. What we haven't been doing historically is dealing with failure. We've never, I'm sorry, actually, errors. We have not been dealing with errors in a way that is modeled inside of our applications. Everybody's trying and patching stuff, and it's spread everywhere inside of our application. We know that this isn't particularly a good idea, but this is the model that we've had for years, and we continue to do it. Instead, what if errors are nothing more than messages inside of our application? They're just ordinary events. Now we can model it just like any other domain. And as a result, we know exactly what we're going to do when one of these kinds of errors occurs. There's a difference between being able to you know, um, commit an update to the database, and that's failing for varying reasons, between, or compare that to not being able to connect to the database. These need to be handled in distinctly different ways. <coughs> And that means that if you model it appropriately, now you can say that just for being unable to you know, update the data store, you know, I, I communicate that back to the user. Something's wrong here and I can't do it right now. Or I retry. Who knows? It depends on how you model it. But in the case of a connection, I'm probably receiving my connection from someone outside myself. Somebody's providing it to me. I need to escalate that upward and allow that failure, that, that error, to be handled appropriately at the right level. So API resilience. Inside of ACA, one of the things that they're trying to do is, is randomize the sort of things that can go wrong inside of their tests. And so they've created something they call the Failure Injector Transport Adapter, which they call the Gremlin. And the gremlin's job is to go around and sort of wreak havoc in, in a uh, random fashion so that they can test things that they never expected, if you will. Of course, that does mean that they have to have written the gremlin based on the expectation that these are areas they can fail. But it's better than just going with static values all the time. Um, having these kind of tools really helps you build reactive tests. And you can see this now more and more with companies who have already experienced catastrophic failures in their business. So, infrastructure resilience. These are the cases with failures, right? And it's not enough that your application knows how to deal with errors inside of itself. It's got to know whenever the network is partitioned. It's got to know when disks fail. 
I mean, you don't have to write that inside of your code, but it's got to know what to do. If it can't perform something as a result of it. So, network resilience. There's a really great post out there by Kyle Kingsbury, also known as a fire. Um, the network is reliable. Of course, he's, you know, he's being bribed when he says that. Um, but what is your plan for network resilience? How are you going to deal with an application that is clustered that cannot talk between nodes? Are you going to be optimistic about it? Where you say, all right, I have a split brain where I have 40% of my application cluster working over here as one subset, and I have 60% of my application running over here as another subset, and they can't talk to one another. Am I going to be optimistic about that and allow that to happen, or am I going to be pessimistic about that and say, no, I have no idea what to do here. I'm going to shut down. Does anybody know Zookeeper's default? If there is a majority, over 50%, it will try to keep that one up. But for anything that's below 50%, it will shut it down. Because what, what would you do if you ended up with 33%, 33%, 33%? Well, that's going to mean that your application comes down entirely now. So you have to have an ops plan for this. For cluster resilience, when network happens, like I said, you've got to deal with optimistic versus pessimistic. What is your plan? So node and machine resilience. In this case, Netflix is really well known for their Chaos Monkey. How many people have seen Chaos Monkey? Yeah. How many people are using Chaos Monkey? It's open source. Why not? Are you not on AWS, right? Of course. Well, if you're not on AWS, it probably sounds like, well, then I can't use it. That's not true. Look at the code. Figure out how you can apply it in your own environment. Because if you don't, you're not going to have something that randomly takes stuff down. They're doing this in production. It's pretty gutsy. So, and it's not just the ability to take down a, a, uh, a cause some sort of random failure. They're also checking things like, um, you know, uh, security certs. They want to make sure that their certs are not expiring. Um, they want to check a whole bunch of things inside of their civilian army here, which I'm showing here. They're checking for latency. Uh, they're checking for unused resources so that they're not being wasteful. Steal this code. It's open source. That's the best thing about open source. We can look at what people are doing who are doing best practices and steal them. For data center resilience, they're actually using something they call the Chaos Kong. You know, at some point, I'm wondering if they're going to come up with the Chaos Kraken or something. This is going to take down the world of computing to see if they're resilient. But, uh, you know, can your application withstand the loss of a data center? Data centers themselves can be spots. If you're only running in one, and that data center goes down, or that availability region goes down, you know, you're, you're, you're rogues. So think about having deployments across multiple regions, across multiple data centers, and what happens when one goes down. When one of them goes down, the other one is still running, has to be able to withstand that load, that possible max bursty load that you have inside your app. And that means for all the people who say, I want all of my machines to be running at 100% CPU usage. That sounds great. Yeah, that's incredibly you know, uh, efficient. But what happens when you get more requests? You got to spin up more nodes. You may not be able to spin up more nodes. It might be better not to be running at 100% all of the time. It might be better to have capacity for when things burst. So Netflix would be like, I'm testing in production. And they are. They actually have ops people sitting there watching stuff whenever they let the monkey loose, whenever they let the chaos gorilla loose, which is the one that takes down the availability zones. Ops people are sitting there watching very closely to find out what the impact is. This way, they know they can withstand another big failure like they had in 2011 or 12, whenever they had a Christmas outage. They lost the whole data center and nobody could watch TV. It was terrible. <laughs> People had to spend Christmas together. <laughs> so responsiveness. Testing responsiveness means you have to have a latency profile. Gil Tanay is running around the world talking about this and he's doing a really great job. He's got this coordinated omission talk. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Before you start building a service, you have to know what your expectations for how quickly it must respond are. 
And you have to do that across multiple throughputs. It's not just saying that, you know what, I've got an average latency that I wanted 50 microseconds or 50 milliseconds or something. It's flawed. It doesn't take into account the reality of bursts of traffic that are going to cause greater latency, right? But your average isn't what matters. Your max is what matters. And in this case, breaking it down across the percentiles, 99% of my requests will be handled in 10 milliseconds whenever I have 1,000 requests per second. But whenever I go to 99.999% uh, of my requests, they'll be handled in 50 milliseconds. You know, there is the outliers. How deep do you want to go? Do it across multiple levels of requests per second. Do it for 1,000 requests per second. Do it for 5,000 requests per second. In this case, I only show three. Do as many profiles as you want. Because as you're doing this, you're getting intelligence about how your application acts in varying circumstances. And this will help you define your SLA. And responsiveness is really about tying the room together. It's when you're testing responsiveness, it's also testing your elasticity. It's also testing your fault tolerance at the same time. So, summary and questions. Now that I bored everybody talking about testing for, I don't know, 40 minutes or something. Testing must begin at the beginning, and it must work from the inside out, that reverse onion pattern. Testing must be functional and non-functional. It can't be just making sure that my code gives me the right responses. It also has to be dealing with the various infrastructure failures that we can have. Um, and elasticity is also tested externally, right? We want to make sure that this elasticness, the way we're scaling across our boxes up and down, is being proven so that we're not wasting resources. Uh, and that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Wow, I could be asleep, huh? <laughs> yes? Um, I don't know if I speak loud enough, but um, how do you tie all this together? Um, to do that from, because basically, this is just. I just interpreting it to see at scale. So the idea is how do you tie everything uh, you have shown us into something which can be uh, uh, available and which can be which can serve as um, input to, uh, to to the team or to the company or to where is the new software. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me rephrase it. Uh, just wanted to know how do you handle, uh, how do you put that in frame inside the software development project? I'm really mean. I actually heard you better before you had the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. And that sounds ridiculous. I don't know. In the mic. So, um, I'm just, I'm just uh, I'm, I really think it's very important, and I just want to go from your experience how do you tie all this together in a single development project? Everybody gets aware of that. What, what is that? Right. Um, if you're in business and stakeholders and all the people up there. Right. Um, this, is, this is actually tricky because it flies in the face somewhat of continuous deployment. Right. Um, whenever you're doing these levels of tests, you are delaying the time it takes for this code to be pushed because you have to prove it in so many different ways. Um, at the same time, I'm much more not of the continuous deployment mindset. I think it works for certain companies who are working in certain ways. Like, you know, Facebook does it. I don't know that they do it for every system that they have. They're doing it much more for the front end, right? Because it's built with CSS and JavaScript. And this has to be done following a perspective of like the blue-green slices. And if you're doing switches between blue-green slices multiple times a day, that's great. I don't know anybody who is. Has anybody else ever run into a company doing blue-green that is you know, switching back and forth multiple times per day. You have? I know of a data company in Sweden that does it with just a million users per day. Okay. And then yeah. They actually do microservices and they switch the whole stack at once. Monolithically? Yeah. So, so the, the question, the, the person in the case this is being important. Uh, the person is saying that they're actually switching multiple times a day for microservices that are all being redeployed at once instead of individually. Yeah. Which is also different. Okay. And exactly they do A-B testing in a similar way by just splitting up two. Right. 
Yeah, okay, so they're doing A-B testing while they're splitting off. Yeah, I think they're deploying two, three times a day. Okay. What, what I typically see and what I typically tell people to do is deploy at the, you know, microservice level. This isn't going to be a monolithic deployment. These blue greens have to be specific to every one of the microservices that you're putting into production, right? Because we don't want these monolithic deployments. And if you're doing a monolithic deployment, yes, you can do all these huge tests and stuff like that leading up to it, but I'm not really comfortable with applications that are deployed that way. They're just too stodgy and they don't, they don't allow you to be agile enough as you're building out your systems. What if only one thing needs to change in your system? Are you going to redeploy the whole new monolith again? That's the way we've been doing it. But if you have these microservice approaches where individual microservices have their own deployment path, those microservices have to pass through a whole testing pipeline individually that meets the requirements of elasticity for that microservice, you know, resilience for that microservice, and responsiveness for that microservice. Does that sort of answer the question? Or not? I'm not sure. Do you want to talk about it afterwards? No. It might be easier to do. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, we were talking earlier about the like to about letting the compiler do more work for you yeah. and like safety and all that. And um, as much as I love to work with Akna and Deskit and the, the what you talked about uh, Marks, uh, one thing I find difficult with Akka is that you can lose the, the, the type safety and everything. You're you're in the wild and, and in fact you're really relying on your tests more than the compiler because all these internal protocols that you're writing for your inside your application, the only way they can be checked is through unit testing. And uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, every refactoring, uh, really, you really, really rely on these unit tests uh, every time you refactor your code to be like, oh, did I miss a message or did I uh, add something? Yeah. Uh, is there, I don't know, I, mean, I guess the question is like, is there, uh, how, how do you uh, deal with it? Uh, in the uh, plans to. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to let Roland answer this because he's actually the author of the test yet. Yeah, I'm also the ACA project now. Yeah. So um, we'll, I'm currently doing some research in, in having gen generically typed ACA regs, uh, which would basically lift the type safety to the same level as you have for functions otherwise. Um, I hope that we will have a preview of this as an experimental feature in the beginning of next year. And then going forward, I, I hope to, to um, develop ACA in a fashion that is actually type safe in the fashion that you want. Right. Yeah, there's another aspect to it though. When you're testing, um, I tend to write my actors in a um, state machine way, where they used to become, I actually don't use FSM that much. I shouldn't have said that in front of Rowan. But <laughs> I, t I tend to use become. I have receive blocks that, come, you know, that, that change to a different receive block based upon you know, uh, an event that occurs inside my system. I test those really, really closely. And you have to. Because you want to make sure that you're switching to the right state based upon events that occur. Right? And you don't want variance in that. Um, but you're right, I mean, it is the untyped world when you talk about message interactions. People say to us, well, why can't, you know, um, actor rep be parameterized, right? And part of the problem there has to do with things like sender. When you have access to the actor rep that was the sender of a message, that could be any actor rep. And so you're either generalizing it up to where it's useless or it's almost kind of existential. Or we remove it. Or you're removing. Are you removing center? Yeah. You nuts. I hope you, I hope you don't take away my ability to see who sent me the message because all my tests depend on that. Um, yeah, those are uh, those are really big deals, right? So testing is really important for message interactions. But then again, those are the API anyway. That's what you should be testing in Akka. You know, it's just knowing whether or not you got a response. I mean, and and the. Non-determinism of time and stuff like that is tricky. There's a time factor inside of the ACA test kits configuration that you can use as well. On your box, you might have to scale that up because your box is going to be slower than the server is going to run up. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, mocking? Uh, yeah. Um, all right. Are you a fan of mocking? Right. 
I don't mock in Outback. Uh, and the reason is because the problem with mocking has always been you have an interface, right? Uh, and this could be possibly, you know, because some weirdo out there put 100 methods inside of this interface. And when they did that, now whenever you have to create a stub, you have to say that you've got to implement in some way, shape, or form 100 stupid things, yeah. right? And, and Uncle Bob Martin has gone on and on about these things. I, I disagree with him about a lot of things, but I think it's right here. If you have a lot of interfaces to test, that's a sign of a bad implementation for an interface, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, but with ACA, I don't have to worry about any of this with actors because I can define a stub that handles just the message I want, yeah. and anything else is a failure. Yeah, yeah. And it is, but you know, it's 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 not using a mocking framework like Mockito or EasyMock or JMock or any of those things. Yeah. And so I, I, I tend not to use them with actor systems. On the other hand, every time I go back to the Java world and I start writing JUnit, I end up using something like that again. And yeah, that's just I don't know how it. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, with this blue green switching. Yeah. How does that work if you've got like a persistent storing component in your switching? Um, so is the where's the persistent store actually located? Where it's the, the yeah, I mean this is this is the microservice. The, the yeah. persistent store they're using should be external to the microservice, right? Um, you switch your data, your database. Oh yeah, yeah. You're not messing with that. How can you? You don't mess with that. Yeah. Was there two databases? I don't know. Because that would be that. Where are you? There. No, okay. Well, there's a database server over here. This blue and green, right? But uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't mess with my databases at all. Yeah, I just grabbed a picture from this blog post and I'd have to reread to figure out exactly what he's talking about there for the database server. This is just from the microservice perspective. I want the blue and the green, right? Um, but yeah, your database is your database. And believe me, the DBA is going after you if you mess with that, right? So, I don't know. But it's also the same for caches, right? The, if you use something like a React cache or a mempache or something like that, those are also going to be external to your your deployment, and you're not going to switch between them, because otherwise everybody's going to be a cache miss whenever uh, you go to the next region, right? They should all be pointing in the same store. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I did the uh, Coursera course on reactive programming, and I came away with an impression uh, that seems to be confirmed by your presentation that uh, if a business person asked me whether they should implement their uh, application on an actor network, I would say if avoid it, uh, do something that's more high level so you can avoid all this, because this is very very heavy stuff you need to really uh, test it yeah. with all the aspects that you mentioned. Uh, um, and coordination too, anytime you have coordination, mm -hmm. I think with the, you were saying this, if you, if, you can, if you can avoid coordination, the more you can do that, the more you can avoid clustering, the better off you're being. And also especially the uh, non-determinism, I mean, if I think of a, of a build pipeline where at some point I just have to decide whether So would you, would you agree that uh, if ever possible, it's better to look for higher level paradigms like uh, data flow concurrency that you have in ACA or uh, MapReduce or something like that? That really um, ACA is sort of um, a middle layer where if ever you can, you can map a business problem to something that's higher level, then you can go for that to avoid some of these. Yes, I would. Um. Yeah, it, it's just the staging, right? Uh, flow from one component to another, yes, and then the individual components being built like ACA. But then you could also still use ACA as, as sort of a clustering mechanism. It's just you would have roles or something like that. You use roles for data flow. I wouldn't do that. How would you? Okay. Use? Ask me if that's a good question. Okay. What am I talking? All right. So, <laughs> sorry for that. No, I, I agree. So if, if, you can, uh, if you can express your, your program in a completely deterministic fashion, I mean, you can just start out by as pure as, uh, as functional programming as you can make it. And sometimes that doesn't work, then you need to do different things. Then you do uh, data flow concurrency if you need concurrency. But if you need true non-determinism, which, which is necessary for certain things. So I, I, 
Uh, yeah, this, yeah. this morning, this morning, I, I outlined two different reasons why you need to distribute, and distribution always requires you to go a little bit deterministic. So at that point, you will have to cross that kind of chasm. But as long as you can stay on that on the, on the safe side, yes, of course, and that also makes testing safer. But then once you need to hop over for elasticity or resilience, then well, you do need to, and then you need to apply these tests, no matter which framework uh, you, you choose to implement your solution. And the thing is that that kind of implementation isn't necessarily going to be reactive by the definition of message driven, you know, um, which means that, you know, as you're saying, distribution versus scaling is going to be tougher. Maybe you're, you're pipelining instead. Anybody else? Yes. I didn't know the building uh, adapter is part of uh, the test kit or? The which adapter? The, the building. Remnants? Remnants. Remnants. You know Remnants? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, that, that's part of the multi-node test kit, which is separately published. Right, yeah. um, it, it also has a, what we call a test conductor, where you can inject failures. Like, you can, you can black out the network connection to a certain node and things like that. So, but that's what it is. I didn't want to make this talk purely about the active test kit. Maybe I should have. Then it would have been more concrete. I had this, I was going to use this testing asynchronous thing that we have inside the book. Um, but there's no way to talk through that in this talk with all this code and have it be a fact. I literally had to scrap it. I was deleting slides before I talked. Sorry about that. I wanted to show more code. Um, anything else? Okay, well, thank you.